Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much um, for joining us. And for those online, so we are streaming on MixLR and on Telegram um, at the moment. But MixLR has a, um, a bit of limit. So in three hours, we'll be off MixLR, but I think we can continue on Telegram um, in case you are sharing it with people. So currently, we're on MixLR and Telegram, right? Um, just as P. Sam said, Today, what we are looking to do is give answers to the pressing questions on people's hearts. There's something I always tell people that <laughs> the way life is, um, and I think young people, when I say young people, I don't mean you young people, because I too am young. We young people have a way of thinking that life is forever, like we have so much time. But if there's something that history has taught us, if there's even something that our reality has taught us, is the fact that we don't have um, as much time as most times we think we have. A good example I like to use is, I remember very vividly um, how, how I was when I was 17 years old. And when I was 17, I used to think, oh, in five years' time, I'll be this. Then I used to tell myself that, oh, in five years' time, when I, you know, they'll ask you, what do you want to be in five years? How many of you in, in university, you filled your yearbook and they asked your five-year plan, your 10-year plan? And lo and behold, when I was writing my five-year and 10-year plan, in my mind, I was thinking like five years. Five years is such a long time. <laughs> I laugh in, I laugh in, I don't know what to say, right? So if you, if you remember how five years ago you were thinking, the state of your mind, you'd understand that, you see this concept called time, we don't have it in the abundance that sometimes we think we do, right? Um, and you can take it back, 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 as much as I don't know what age you remember the most. Why am I saying this? Life is too short, one. Life is too fickle to live it in such a way that, to live it in such a way like as if there's no consequence. Life is too short and too fickle to spend all of your life in the wrong place, at the wrong state of mind. Life is too short, life is too fickle to spend it living a lie, right? So very shortly, what I just want to talk to you about is about Jesus and how he is the way to the Father. We know that the world was framed by the word of God. We know that this world, like we woke up one day and found ourselves here. <laughs> Let me, for lack of a better word, when I say we woke up, maybe, I don't know at what age you start asking some tough questions or at what age you came into whatever realization of life is or at what age you start asking, what is this life? Whatever the age is, you woke up one day and you found yourself here. Um, and different people, different things will try and tell you why you are here or how you got here. But we understand that the world were framed by the word of God. We understand that this world was created by God. Some people call it for, and I don't know why, universe, nature, whatever it is they want to call it, but we understand that the world was framed by the word of God. And everyone acknowledges that there is a cause. Whether people decide that the cause is science, or nature, or universe, or Buddha, or whatever cause, whatever it is that they want to, everybody at some point in time is trying to answer a question, why am I here and how did I get here? But we understand something, that the world had a cause. Like, as long as I'm living and breathing here, I can have this conversation with you, and you can understand what I'm saying. There's a reason, and there's a how, and there's a why as to why I'm here. For us, we know that this cause is the God who made the world and everything in it. He's the Lord of the heaven and the earth. And he's not, he's not made, he's not a fragment or a figment of our imagination. He's not whatever people say he is, this is the God who created the heavens and the earth. And he did this for his glory. We understand that the omnipotent, the omnipresent, the omniscient, not omniscient, <laughs> the omniscient God created everything. And so we most times want to answer the question, why? And those are part of the things that we'll, di we'll, we'll dive deeper into as we go and we answer different questions today. But just follow me, right? Um, we know that he did this so that men will seek him, reach out to him, and find him. 
In other words, there is no meaning to this life that you're living without God. There is no meaning. People can decide to anchor their um, reason for why they are breathing in some thought or some theology or some worldview. But the only place and the only person who will give you true meaning, who will answer the tough questions of life when it comes to meaning, when it comes to purpose, when it comes to origin, is God. And when we look deeper to see how God has answered this question, we realize that he has answered this question in the person of Jesus. Let me reiterate again that God is not a man-made notion, right? Um, or let me put it this way, the God that I'm talking about, because I always need to clarify, the funny thing with the way the world has gotten to today, when you say God, many people are hearing different things. Sometimes when you say God, some people are thinking of Krishna. Some are thinking of Orisha. Whatever it is, the God I'm talking about is the uncursed causer who created the heaven and the earth. The God of the heaven and the earth is the person I'm speaking about, and he's not a man-made thing. See, when men want to make idols, when men want to make gods, the best you get is Thor Pro Max. When men want to come up with different ideas of what a superhuman type of person should come about, we will give you Avengers. They will give you all manner of concepts. But what I'm talking about is not a concept that was made by man. Okay? And um, humans actually don't have any problem with creating idols. One comfort you should receive, I don't know if it's going to be a cause of, con it shouldn't be a cause of concern, but one comfort you receive is in understanding that um, this earth, scientists would tell us, is millions or billions of years old. Um, humanity and civilization is thousands of years old. And since time passed, human beings have always created all manner of idols. In fact, if you've ever tried, if you've gone down that rabbit hole of Greek mythology, or Indian mythology, or all manner of things, you see all manner of interesting stories. That should give you an insight as to what man-made type of idols look like. So man doesn't actually have a problem creating idols, um, right? But this is not the God I'm talking about. This God I'm talking about is, like I've said for like the 10th time, is the God of, is the, God of the universe, and he has a clear will, and that clear will is in the person of Jesus. That clear will is in the person of Jesus. So let's talk a bit about this Jesus. What people need to realize is, and we've come across different questions about this person of Jesus, but let me just say it briefly, and like I said, we're going to dive deeper. Jesus actually walked the face of this earth. Over 2,000 years ago, there was a person called Jesus who walked on the earth, and he made some very strong claims he made some actually very strong claims. He said he was going to do some things. He claimed to be God. He claimed to be so many things. And before I go into the types of claims that he made, I just want to emphasize something. Um, one of my brothers here is going to talk about the historicity of the Bible and things like that. And the reason why the historicity of the Bible is important to us is because the Bible tells us about Jesus. The Bible was not made up by Constantine or Council of Nicaea or what are the other funny things that people say the Bible was made up of. The Bible is actually a historically proven document. And what we see in that document is that there was a certain person called Jesus who walked on the face of this earth and he made some claims. And here is the fantastic thing about the claims that he did. He proved his claims when he resurrected from the dead. So let's go into some of these claims that he made. And I'm just going to be reading some different things. One, he claimed that God loved the world and gave his one and only son, who he, who he was, that's Jesus, and said that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. He claimed that he did not send him, Jesus, to the world to condemn it, but to save the world through him. And that whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already. He claimed that he is the way, not one of many ways. 
He is the only way to, G- to God. He's the way, he's the truth, and he's the life. And no one can get to God except through him. He claimed that he is the gate. And that whoever enters through him will be saved. He claimed that it is only through him that you could have life and have life to the full. He claimed that he was the bread of life, or he is the bread of life, and that whoever comes to him will never go hungry, and whoever believes in him will never be thirsty. And he claimed that he is the life, and the life that he is is the light of all men. And this is just a few amongst many. Right? And different notions have come up about Jesus to say, oh, maybe Jesus was just a strong, uh, what's it called, person. He was just a strong historical, charismatic figure. But when somebody makes claims like this, it's one of two things. He's either a madman or what he's saying is actually true. Because if he's that he was a strong historical figure, maybe what he would have just come to say is, okay, love and light, peace, let everybody love one another, let's all do this. But this is someone that is claiming that I am the only way to God and that I have come so that people can have life. Um, I like the way C.S. Lewis puts it, right? Where he says that, um, so I'll just read it. He says, I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. That is Jesus. I'm ready to, and the thing that people say, used to say, and still say about Jesus is that I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. But C.S. Lewis says that that is one thing that we must not say. A man who is merely a man and said the sort of things that Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level of a man who says he's a poached egg, or he will be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man, that is Jesus, was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about him being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us, and he did not intend to. Jesus did not come claiming to just be a great moral teacher. He he came claiming to be God. So I'm going to round up with this, right? Jesus is God, and he's the only way to the Father. And there is salvation in no one else. There is no other name under heaven by which man can be saved um, except Jesus. So thank you again for joining us. Sit tight.